I asked you to tell me the name of an emerging power, I can almost be certain that in most cases, your first answer would be the People's Republic of China. Now, depending on how we formulate the question, the question has nuances. Power to do what exactly? If we're talking about industrial and exporting power, there is no doubt. Demographic power? Obviously. Economic power? Not inconsiderable. But what about military power? It is this last question that will be the focus of our attention today. How is the military evolution of the Asian giant going? Can we already speak of the budding armed globalization of China? How does it rank in relation to the United States? Take a look at this graph as an example. The baseline US military budget was $778 billion in 2020, while China's spending barely exceeded $250 billion. In other words, Uncle Sam more than triples the military spending effort of China. Of course, it's hardly surprising either. The US military budget is so large that it exceeds those of China, India, Russia, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Germany, France, Japan, South Korea, Italy, and Australia combined. That's the military budget of an entire huge global force. So, with the numbers in hand and taking into account the huge differences that still separates them, it seems unlikely that China would end up catching up to the United States in terms of military budget for at least the next two decades. Now then, hold on a minute. Does it really need to be able to rival the American giant? Well, let's find out. During the last 30 years, China has changed a lot. And the thing is that its understanding of the army, national defense, and particularly foreign policy have also undergone a huge revolution. A revolution that could be divided into three very different phases. The first phase corresponded to Mao Zedong's strategy of defense through large-scale protracted warfare. Its essential basis was to have a huge, gigantic army, even if it was rudimentary and ill-equipped. If necessary, this plan even envisaged mobilizing the citizens themselves when necessary, even if they had no specific training or equipment. Then, the second phase was known as the 24-character strategy. It was promoted by Deng Xiaoping and involved maintaining a low external military profile in order to promote economic development and not be seen as a threat by the rest of the world. This strategy remained intact during Zhang Zemin's presidency, although it began to change during the Hu Jintao era, when the great military modernization began. Finally, the third phase corresponds to the idea of to the return of the Middle Kingdom, a strategy promoted by Xi Jinping through the so-called national rejuvenation, and which implies placing China once again as the backbone of political life in Asia. To this end, the Chinese dictator has expressly ordained the People's Liberation Army to become a first-grade military force by 2049. <laughs> And take note, because Xi Jinping's idea is not only to have a first-rate army to defend China, but also to use it to expand its area of political influence. Don't think for a moment that all this is mere hot air and ramblings. The speeches and above all the actions of the Chinese leader leave no room for doubt. As we put conscious effort into learning from history to create a bright future, we must accelerate the modernization of national defense in the armed forces. In heroic and tenacious struggle, the CCP and the Chinese people solemnly declare to the world that the Chinese nation welcomes the advent of a great leap from rising to modest prosperity and nascent strength, the Chinese nation has entered an irreversible historical process. Xi Jinping, President of PR China. Quite a statement of intent there. But how did it come to this point? And the million dollar question, did China's opening up and development policies have the clear and predetermined objective of making the country once again the dominant power on the Asian continent? Or is it something that is happening as a result of the evolution of events themselves? Whatever the case, the fact is that it was President Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping's predecessor, who ruled China between 2003 and 2013, who began to break with Deng Xiaoping's non-interventionist vision. Check this out. We should attach great importance to maritime, space and cyberspace security. We should make active planning for the use of military forces in peacetime, expand and intensify military preparedness and enhance the capability to accomplish a wide range of military tasks. The most important of which is to win local war in an information age. Hu Jintao, former president of the PR China. Yes, that's right. 
Contrary to what many think, it was Hu and not Xi who started the Chinese military escalation. Of course, the current leader has taken things much further. We only have to think of Hong Kong or the constant provocations against Taiwan. You could almost say that the difference between Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping is the difference between wanting it and believing it. Hu wanted it and Xi Jinping believes it is within reach. <laughs> The fact is that Hu Jintao launched a strong and rapid modernization of the People's Liberation Army. For example, during his presidency, the military budget quadrupled in absolute terms. The barrier of $150 billion a year in defense spending was surpassed for the first time. And in his last three years in office, Jintao increased the military budget at a rate of between 13 and 18% year on year. Thanks to this, in the Jintao era, China began operating its first aircraft carrier, launched the first two versions of a stealth bomber, and developed a whole new range of ballistic missiles. One of them, by the way, is intercontinental in nature. With a range of up to 7,456 miles, or 14,000 kilometers, the Dongfeng 41 is capable of reaching most of the planet. During Hu Jintao's final years, the foundations were laid for Xi Jinping to begin to impose a more active military superiority in Asia, especially in Taiwan and the South China Sea. In other words, the Chinese no longer just have the weapons, they now also use them to show their neighbors who has the power. In other words, what Xi Jinping did was to inherit an arms race that had already begun and which he extended, but with a more bombastic goal, to rebuild China's grandeur, especially from the outside. Of course, in order to achieve this goal, Xi not only needs a more modern military, he needs, above all, to be at least on par with the United States in Asia. And the question is, how much of this ambitious goal has he achieved? Well, let's take a look at that right now. The return of the Central Empire. Believe it or not, yes, there are already aspects in which the Chinese army of 2021 has surpassed even the United States army itself, the most powerful army in the history of mankind. Concretely, we can talk about these areas. Firstly, China has a greater shipbuilding capacity, which has made the Chinese Navy the largest in the world. Technologically and in terms of tonnage, it is still far behind the United States, but its evolution and increasing capacity make it a difficult enemy to beat in a regional conflict. Second are ground-based ballistic and cruise missiles. The Chinese military already has more than 1,250 ballistic missiles ready for use in a regional conflict. And finally, China has the best air defense system in the world. Thanks to the Russian S-300 and S-400 systems, along with other local systems, China's skies are perhaps the most fortified in the world. Of course, at the moment, and this is very, very important, we are talking about regional capabilities. I mean, many times in the media we come across news and reports that describe China in terms of direct competition with the United States in the military field. But that is not strictly true. Chinese leaders are aware that the current gaps remain enormous. For example, while China only has two active aircraft carriers and a third in the process of being completed by 2023, the United States has 20 aircraft carriers in service right now. This is precisely why China's immediate goal is not to become a world superpower, but above all, a regional superpower. Put another way, what Xi Jinping's government seeks is to dominate the new economic heart of the world. And do you know what? In this respect, things are indeed much more equal, and China could very soon surpass the capabilities of the United States. And very importantly, in order to achieve its goal, it needs much fewer resources than the Americans do. Think about it for a moment. While the United States has a huge ocean line between it and China and therefore needs, for example, a large fleet of aircraft carriers, deployment teams and military bases all over the world, the situation of the Asian giant is completely different. <laughs> The Chinese government only needs to have a modern armed forces capable of dealing with what the United States has deployed at its bases in the Asia-Pacific region. In this region, the US power has deployed some 325,000 soldiers, 180 ships, which represents around 60% of the entire US Navy, and some 1,500 aircraft. Well, in order to achieve its goal, China needs to only surpass US capabilities in that region. And this is exactly what they're pursuing, limiting themselves to their immediate neighborhood. In the rest of the world, on the other hand, China follows a strategy of influence completely removed from the military sphere. They are dead dedicated to investing, buying companies, gifting loans to developing countries, and building infrastructure. A strategy that could perhaps bear much fruit in the coming decades, but which currently has no military ambitions whatsoever. 
Of course, there is no need for such a military focus. The world has changed, and today, controlling the Asia-Pacific region is enough to determine all global politics. And that, that is precisely what explains why, when it comes down to it, the difference in military budgets between the United States and China may not be so important. In addition, the Chinese have another advantage, the ethereal boundary between the civilian economy and the military field. You see, since Xi came to power, military requirements were incorporated into civilian infrastructure, and civilian construction was used for military purposes. Civilian logistics and service capabilities have also been harnessed to strengthen the capacity of the armed forces. While deepening and expanding the national defense mobilization system that aims to have all national resources available for use in China's military buildup and eventually in a war. Everything we are telling you has a name and a fancy title. The Military Civil Fusion Development Strategy, also known as MCF for its acronym in English. To put this in perspective, Chinese defense industrial base hasn't been so fused with civilian and industrial technology since at least the time of Mao Zedong. So what does all this mean? Basically, the Chinese government wants to apply all the technological and operational evolution of Chinese companies to the military field. In other words, the Chinese government wants to turn the country into a fortress and an unbeatable force in the Asia-Pacific region. To achieve this, Xi Jinping is ready to use all necessary resources, including the resources of private Chinese companies. And that, that also means that in some ways, the military budget may not be reflecting the full effort that China is really putting into the military. Okay, so do you want a concrete example? Well, here we have the so-called Chinese String of Pearls, a mega project that consists of the development of bases, ports, and naval structures under the control of Chinese companies from the East China Sea to the Mediterranean. The point is that, in theory, the network has a civilian focus, but let's not fool ourselves. It is very likely that many of its hubs also have a potential military use. Of course, military analysts take this aspect for granted. That is to say that the race between the United States and China, the real race, the race that matters, may be much more closely fought than we might at first think. So let's recap. The economic, technological and military superiority of the United States over China is gigantic. But in spite of this, it is no longer clear that the American power could easily overcome China in the Asia-Pacific region, the new economic and industrial heart of the world. This is the armed globalization that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party dream of, controlling the crown jewel in order to influence the whole world. More importantly, it is in this strategy where Xi Jinping seems to be getting his way, and that is exactly where the new priority of the United States of America lies. But at this point, it's over to you. How do you think the United States and Western countries in general can contain China's growing dominance in the world's most important region? Leave your answers in the comments below. And if you found this video interesting, which of course you did, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. All the best, and I'll see you next time.